Good morning, and God bless you. As we uh, worship in the name of Jesus this morning, <clears throat> it's good to be here. Uh, last evening, we sort of left a little late, and uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we uh, turned the corner there at Arley and headed this way up through the the valley, and it's so beautiful. Maybe about five miles up the road, a, a big bull elk crossed the road from the river across right in front of us, and I turned around and got my headlights on a nice six-point elk, so if you want to go chase him tomorrow, you could do that, but then we come on up through the uh, valley here, the lights on the water there at Thompson Falls, and it just brings back good memories of your people here, and uh, I believe if I moved, if I lived over here, I'd come to church with y'all. I really enjoy this uh, community and your congregation. God bless you this morning. So, uh, I guess I'll just tell you a little story. It's been, I think, two years since we've been here. Uh, we helped uh, William with uh, the ordination when. Wendell was commissioned for two years as a lead pastor here, a bishop, and so uh, Wendell called here, called me a couple months ago and asked if I would come and, and carry out another bishop ordination, and I said I would, and we also asked Wendell to come and help us the third weekend of December for ours, so we're looking forward to that. Anyway, I guess to get the elephant out of the carpet or whatever, uh, we plan to come in uh, December 3 here and have this ordination. And it's a little uh, different to have an ordination where you know one of the three men will be asked to lead out. When you have a minister ordination, it's, you, you don't know who, and that's... That's just the way it is. But for a bishop, you have three men that are, are uh, eligible or, or will be asked to be eligible to do this work. And uh, so I called William and I said, well, what if uh, Wendell would be asked again? Do I reordain him or is he just commissioned again to g keep going? And he said, yes, you ordain him uh, if he is called and you lay hands on him and you you give him the charge for indefinite, which would be my understanding, 10 years to 60 years. I'm not sure. I'm looking forward to, to stepping down in our congregation. I've been serving for, it'll be 14 years, and I may be a, a slightly on the young side just by a few years maybe for what I can handle, but I've enjoyed it. It's been a good work, but I'm happy to pass it on to our next uh, almost a generation, not really, but I'll, I'll be 60 this next year, and uh, our young ministers are 35 to 45, and they're doing a great job, and I think it is a great time to pass that baton on or whatever it is that we just keep our ministry fresh and I want to help where I can and serve but I want to be a part of a growing church that uh, has vision and I, I believe that's what you have here this morning. I enjoyed the service very much. Serving God and God bless your congregation as you think of a longer term leader it's just part of the work. Psalm 99, let's turn to Psalm 99. And I'm going to share a message this morning of maybe qualifications for being a lead pastor. There's so many words to describe a bishop, an elder. Uh, one of the ministers in our congregation last week, I went to our uh, instruction class. And Amos, our minister, he shared... It was about the church and leaders, and he said a bishop and an elder is the same word in the New Testament, and I think that's scriptural. 
There's words to describe a bishop, a lead pastor, a lead shepherd maybe would be more, uh, that'd be scriptural, a moderator, a chairman, that's, someone needs to be a leader among the leaders. Uh, I like to think of a bishop as a minister of ministers. Uh, he ministers to the ministers. He, he wants to, a bishop should work hard to help the newer ministers shine and, and develop their talents because they will replace them. And it doesn't take long. The church keeps moving on. And 20 years go so fast. I met T Toby and Rosetta last night. I don't know if I saw you in the last 20 years, but all of a sudden their children are grown and our youngest children are grown the age of your children. 20 years goes so fast and the church needs to stay fresh. If, if us 50 year olds turn into 75 and 85 year olds, uh, we, need, we need a fresh vision every 10 years and maybe more often, maybe not quite as often. That's that's God's work, but we should be proactive in seeing that things happen. Psalm 99. As I think about ministers, I have scattered thoughts of just the work of the ministry. Psalm 99 says, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be removed. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the people. Let them praise thy God and terrible name, for it is holy. The king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou doest establish equity. Thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among them that call upon his name. They call upon the Lord, and he answereth them. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. Thou answeredest them, O Lord our God, thou wast a God that, forsake, that for, forgavest them. Though they took his vengeance of their inventions, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. You might think, what does Psalm 99 and 100 have to do with church life? But as I think of a church, active church that is progressing spiritually and and as a light in the community, this, these words jump out at me all over. Moses and Aaron, among the leaders, and Samuel, they called upon the name of the Lord. And he answered them, God's not dead. When leaders call out to God, God talks back to them. Did you know that? Sometimes church life is so dried up that you wonder if God's somewhere Anywhere, where is God? Well, we talk to God and he comes back to us. He spoke to them in a cloudy pillar. Sometimes God might seem kind of out there far away, but he speaks through the clouds, comes to us. And they kept his testimonies and, and, and the ordinances that he gave them. That's, that's, a, that's the beauty of the church. That God teaches us how to live and, and what kind of people we should be. And we just do it because that's God's the boss. God tells us what to do and we're going to live that way. It's not a dried up Christianity. It's exciting to know that God has some answers for us of how to live. And, and we just do that and, 
and it makes a uh, happy church life. Oh, Lord, our God, thou wast a God that forgave us when we mess up. He forgives us. And I'm not sure what it means about taking vengeance on inventions, but God's not impressed with the fancy stuff we come up with. Exalt the Lord our God and worship and make a joyful noise. Uh, I'd like to share that this morning that we serve the Lord with gladness. The ministry needs to be uh, excited about coming before the presence of God in a worship service. That's part of the work of the ministry to help energize people to to love the Lord and to be excited about being Christians. It's not dried up religion, I guess, what we heard this morning. But Christianity is finding answers for our families and our youth and us as older people to be faithful. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generation. The church keeps going. The church has been established for thousands of years. And uh, is it doing a good job? It's up to us to see that we're following God the way he wants us to do it. So I feel sorry for the ministers this morning that I'm preaching a message to you, but on the other hand, I don't feel sorry for you. Just go ahead and, and take it. <laughs> uh, it's okay to be challenged and, and to be encouraged. I would like to share this as a message of encouragement. And uh, my, uh, my uh, thoughts would be bring it on. Teach us how as pastors... Uh, when I preach a message, I, I preach to myself also. And I want to learn how to do a better job at my work. Every good leader in a business world, they want to learn how to do things better. Because uh, going broke is not the ultimate goal of a business. Uh, doing things well, I think we should try to, to achieve to that. So, let's turn to Philippians 2, 1 through 8. I still have a few thoughts here on joy. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is for everyone. It's not just for the ministry that may be asked to be the lead pastor. But as the church works together, these verses here are so beautiful. We're like-minded. We have the same love. We're of one accord, one mind in Jesus Christ. 
It's not that we all look exactly alike and everyone wears a black pair of pants and a white shirt Sunday morning so that we have this one accord. Uh, I've heard uh, Dale Heisey years ago said, sameness is not oneness. You know, if, if ever, God didn't make us all in one box, but as we are maybe different, different personalities, different characters, different backgrounds, uh, we're, with, we're together in the church, one accord and one mind, and nothing should be done through strife or vainglory, and then it comes into being a servant of the Lord. And I'd like to talk about, as leaders, being servants, because communism does not work, and in, 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 in the political systems of the world, communisms rise with a lot of horsepower, and then they fall, and kingdoms rise and fall, and socialism, and but free enterprise in business and in, and in politics seems to work. And I believe it's a godly principle. Uh, as we look at godly principles, when, when, when kingdoms follow godly principles, God seems to bless even politics and business. But this is a godly prison principle that, that leadership is, uh, is serving it's a place of service. There's, in, in, in churches, there's not political signs that says, vote for me. No, it's not that way. But when we're asked to serve, then we serve. We do not campaign for jobs, but we're also available, neither do we run from them and say, no, no, I don't want to do this. I, I, that's not for me. Uh, we want to be available to serve God, but it's a place of service. We're following the Lord Jesus Christ, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. All the leaders, all the members of the church, we're bowing to our chief shepherd. When the chief shepherd shall appear, that's who we're going to answer to. And uh, every one of us is serving the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're serving together. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus he did not consider himself equal with God. Well, he, he was equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He took on him the form of a servant. And if Jesus took on him the form of a servant, why in the world shouldn't we as ministers not be servants? Matthew 20. The reason I want to stress being a servant of the Lord is because I think it's the only way that works. If we're going to have successful long-term church life, leaders must be servants. Matthew 20, verse 20. The thought here is we can be following Jesus and still not be a servant. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons worshiping him and desiring certain things of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he said unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand, and on my left, is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. God decides where we are. Jesus didn't even take that upon himself. In verse 24, And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. So they were following Jesus. Verse 25, but Jesus called them unto him and said, You know not, you know, you know that the princes of the Gentiles, the worldly political system, the religious people of the day, exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. 
but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Humility. Serve, serve. Jesus kept teaching us, serve, serve, serve people. Love humility. I heard that in our devotional this morning. To love humility. Not just exercise it, but love, the, love that lowly job of being humble. It's easy to see humility in others or to see that they don't have it also. It's a little tougher to see it in ourselves that, you know, I am doing a good job with humility. It doesn't seem to... So I think we should be careful. Am I living my life in humble service? Being a lead pastor is the lowest job in the church. In my view of Scripture... Who that, he that will be greatest among you will be your servant. To lift others up. To help others progress and grow in their Christian life. John 13, verse 13. You call me Lord and Master, and ye say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. You probably just observed communion. I'm not sure. We just did a couple weeks ago, and we have a feet washing service. And it's pretty embarrassing, I think, as time goes on. People are getting more embarrassed and ashamed to wash feet. It's just kind of a lowly project. But, and I've heard the suggestion, why, this is obsolete, washing people's feet. Why don't we wash each other's cars? Let's, let's put the cars out in front, and we'll come through and we'll wash cars. Well, it's not embarrassing to wash somebody's car, or it's not lowly. It's not very lowly. We'd have pressure washers and squeegees and everything, you know. But to wash people's feet, to serve people. Jesus did it for us to show us that we should serve people. It's an emblem we do two times a year. And it doesn't make us servants, but it's it's an outward sign of what we're doing inside. That I will wash your feet for the next six months. And I will care about you. I won't take advantage of you. I'll weep with you when you weep. I'll rejoice when you rejoice. I will serve you. Colossians 3, 10 to 14. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. All of us, if we're going to have a good church, the bishop's not going to make a good church. But he needs to be the example of all this. And I think the bishop will have your back as you exercise this. He's going to say, good job, 
you're forbearing one another. You're forgiving one another. Sometimes bishops get the blame that they're holding people to a standard that they can hardly attain to. But the bishop, I think, should be lifting others up and say, good job, you're, you're forgiving, you're forbearing. If we have quarrels, of course, we're, we're red blood, blood people that make mistakes and we fail. Lead pastors, I, I think this is what Jesus and it's beautiful. Second Timothy. And the servant of the Lord should not strive. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. There is a difference. There's a lot of servants of the Lord that, ah, they shouldn't strive, but they're going to do some of it. I've been that way. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. The bishop should not always come out on top and say it's my way or the highway. or He gets his way every time or many times. Maybe not very often he gets his way. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Uh, if, a, if a leader is kind to a guy that's stepping over top of him, someday that man is going to need help. And who's he going to go to? He's going to go to the man that he took advantage of and say, I need help. Can you help me? He's not going to go to the man that says, you can never take advantage of me. That's not the, how we operate. We go to the people that maybe we have took advantage of, and they were kind to us. And then when we get in trouble, who do we go to? We go to somebody that cares about people, that has some heart in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. A leader should have the skin of a rhinoceros and the heart of a dove to care for the needs of those that oppose themselves. Let someone else be the strong arm leader that comes out on top. But serve the Lord faithful. Second Timothy. Many scriptures I think I'll spend the rest of the uh, message here this morning in 1 Timothy 3. And this gets pretty practical of, of the work of leaders and how they should live. And I think it's okay. I th- I'm, I'm glad the, the, the work of the ministry is defined in the New Testament that says this is what we expect out of our leaders. It's nothing to be afraid of or to run from. It can, it's refreshing to know what kind of person we should be. In our devotions this morning, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 says, it's talking about our Lord and Savior, who will have all men to be saved. Isn't that beautiful? God designed us all that he wants all of us to be saved. And now I go to 1 Timothy 3, and this is just practical stuff of of how a leader should function. 
It says, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. That's, that's a, quite a verse there. When I was ordained bishop, I looked at that verse, and I said, that's got to be the worst verse in the New Testament. Uh, why would someone desire this work? But if we look at the picture of God's kingdom and his holiness, and, and he designs lowly men to exemplify the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's beautiful. A man could chase $2 million in business the, his whole life for $4 million. People make all kinds of money anymore if they just invest 20 to 30 years of good, solid principles in business in America. You can make millions of dollars, but what good does it do? How about the office of a bishop? A faithful, lowly job of loving people. You know, when we get to the end of the life, uh, people are going to be more important than stuff. <clears throat> uh, we do construction, and we haul j construction junk to the landfill just out of Great Falls. We have a big trailer, and every week somebody gets the fun job of going to the dump, but two years ago, one year ago maybe, there was a huge hole where they started in a new section of the dump, and people told me, that's going to take years to fill up, and I said, I don't think so. Well, I was there this last week, and that thing was way higher than the rest of the real estate all around us. That huge hole filled up with stuff, and that's what we work for all year garbage, all, all my money usually ends up at the landfill. Ain't that something? <laughs> Whoever desires this office, he desires a good work. No, we don't want the projects that God sends our way. We're not campaigning, but it is a beautiful thing to invest in people. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant. I'm going to just Pick that verse apart a little bit. Why? Well, blameless. Does the, does the Bible say that a bishop must be perfect? Of course not. But it says blameless. Uh, blameless is a man says he's sorry when he fails. When someone approaches him and says, you messed up, we put our heads down and we say, sorry. Bishop is blameless when he's human and open for counsel, correction. He's humble. The next phrase, the husband of one wife, vigilant. Uh, the, most, the next most important thing for a leader is to be faithful to his family and to his wife. Don't ask the minister if he's faithful to his wife. Ask the wife, is your husband care about you Monday morning or just Sunday at, at the worship service? The wife should be the one that answers that question. The wife of one husband, the husband of one wife, faithful in marital vows, a single eye towards your spouse. John Yoder preached for us, John Miller from Indiana one year. I remember his little story. He just said, there's a picture out there of a Norman Rockwell painting <clears throat> and daddy's sitting in the restaurant with a snazzy waitress serving him and his eyes are staring at the lady and the little boy's eyes are staring at daddy's eyes. And it just tells you the whole story. The husband of one wife. Vigilant. It's worth protecting. A happy home is the heartbeat of the congregation. A happy family is the powerful testimony in the America today. You can carry your Bible, you can carry your wallet anywhere you want and impress people. 
but a family that loves each other and a mom and daddy that love each other is a huge commodity in a world of, of uh, <clears throat> frustration and brokenness. It's the beauty of Christian families worshiping Sunday mornings and getting together and Sunday dinners. I don't care what all you want to describe happy homes and happy families, but you see a happy home and you see a dysfunctioning one, and you can choose before you ever get married which one you're going to have, and you're going to make that decision every morning you wake up. You're going to decide, am I going to have a Christian home, or am I going to have the homes that the devil's saying it ain't worth it? I just want to leave that encouragement today. The next phrase, sober. A leader needs to be sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, a selfish family that never wants to have someone over for it to your house. It's not very uh, appealing. And it's tough to have uh, company when you work too hard all week and you have six little children. It's much easier for us now at 60 with our children grown, but it's, we're tired, more tired now than we had six children. So I don't know if it does get better. But we love to have company. I think it's a beautiful thing. I tell people Sunday night sometimes if I don't want to get in trouble with the ladies, I'll say, come over for popcorn and water, and we'll just visit, you know? Campfires and uh, hot dogs, and you can have such fun doing the simple things in life to practice hospitality. It's the everyday stuff that builds church. We don't leave our people. I'm sometimes the first one to leave church. I, I'm tired. I'm ready to go home. And people sit around and stand around and talk. I, I'm going to check you all out today. But they stay for a long time and visit each other because they like each other. A church that bails out the door and heads home right away, it's not a very good sign. So if you tend to be the first one to leave, maybe check that out. Not given to wine. A drunk preacher, we don't have that much trouble in our groups anymore, but I know uh, we had a preacher from Holmes County just recently, and he said, hey, we're having the young couples are going to restaurants and drinking wine, and they're getting a taste of this stuff. Where's it going to lead to them? We kind of have the, what do you call it, none. If you never drink, you'll never be a drunk, and I think that's a good thing. The Bible doesn't even tell you to get that radical but do you want your boys to be drunks that's my question and a leader needs to be sober no striker not greedy a filthy luger that explains itself but patient not a fighter nor covetousness one that rules well his own house Having his children in subjection with all gravity. You'll never have perfect children. Preachers don't tell your children, we're preachers, we got to be good. You'll put a lot of stress on them. Let your children be children. They're just as naughty as everybody else's. But spank them when they need one. And love them all the time. And be normal. If one... If a one-year-old preacher child throws a fit in church, it's not the worst thing that ever happened. They're just human. But we do take care of our families. We have discipline and we have respect and we have love, love, love. Security for our children, for the, for the minister. He should be an example of the believers for happy, healthy children. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he falls into condemnation of the devil. Our policy is that a minister should be a minister for several years before they're a bishop because 
I guess you can be proud to be a bishop and to have that authority. It should never be that way, but get some experience. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. Does that mean above all else or at least in the community he should have a really, maybe he doesn't have that great a com- testimony in the church, but at least in the community everybody thinks highly of him. Well, it should be both ways, but moreover, of course, this man should have people that are saying, I like to hire this preacher. He, he's a fair. He keeps his word. He looks out for us. Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. The devil just loves to take people down, ministers, and say, ha ha, the church is just a joke. And I've, I've tell, I, I tell people when a minister falls, I like to tell the church, you know, that's a time to rally around the church. And to show the world that, hey, ministers fall, but they can get back up again. And God will not be mocked. God, God takes care of business. When ministers fall and they're a reproach, they can get back up. They can do right again. It's not the end of the world when ministers fail. I'm afraid sometimes we have preachers at such a high standard that if they fall, the whole church falls apart. No way. They're just a servant of the Lord. And they can find healing again too. That's the beauty of redemption. Christianity is real. It is more blessed to give than to receive in in Acts 20. There's a lot of... Wendell just shared a little bit about Acts 20 this morning. Uh, uh, A leader... I'm going to turn to that. A few minutes. I will be closing in a few minutes, but... uh, Acts 20, verse 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Apostle Paul, he was a major league bishop. Today, we're just sissies, if you want to call us that, in in the work of the bishop. I've never been beaten I've never shed a drop of blood for the church. I've, I've lived in prosperity all my life. I think it's a terrible danger that we should be aware of. If we can't make it in today's prosperity, we sure won't make it in persecution. But here's Paul. Verse 23, Save that the Holy Ghost witnessed in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide, my, abide me. But none of these things move me, Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the grace of the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with with his own blood. And that's as far as I'm going to read. Jesus Christ purchased the church with his own blood. I never shed a blood of my own for the church. And I know Paul did, but... He still gave the honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why Christianity is real this morning. For everyone this morning, Christianity is real and exciting and refreshing. And that's the minister's 
work to promote that to his congregation. It's such a blessing to work with congregations where parents want to raise godly children and young men are committing to moral purity and committing to God and to living pure. At our church, we have a fairly fresh group of young men. There must be about 10 of them and a couple mentors, and they just going through purity books, and they're committing to following Jesus. O soul, are you worried and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's hope for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. His word will not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to the world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Uh, this last week I had a few tough things I was look, uh, working through and one night I listen to that song and I listened to it 20 times I said that is the answer it is so beautiful it's, these problems in this world are not mine I can look to Jesus he's got them all solved that's what the follower of Jesus lives for another song I heard this on the way over and I think it's very fitting for us as a church and ordination and who we are and what we're going to be in the next 10, 20 years. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. The song, you're all to us. Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Let the righteousness, let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe you're all to us. The passion of the church. It's not about our powerful ministry team, but servants doing the will of God and blessing our congregation, blessing the people. The people know that the ministers have their backs and that they are blessing them to raise godly families for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you today that you are the chief shepherd of the church and that we can just follow you and that there's no man-made horsepower in the church that does any good, but we can just humble ourselves before you and, and serve the way you're asking us to. And we fail, Lord, teach us how to get back up and to be faithful and to care about hurting people in our communities that, that don't have the answers. And they're, they're looking and give us the courage to just walk beside them. We may not have the answers for their lives, but we know someone who does. And we can just point others to Jesus, help us to do that in our churches. And we could be strong. We could love one another with a pure heart fervently. We could have fervent charity among ourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sin. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we can know who we are. And we bless you. We bless this congregation this next several weeks and our congregation as we make changes and changes are fearful and and the unknown we don't like, but we know that we can trust you, and you do all things well. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.